Hello. All right, that was that was a very tiny one. Hello. Uh, but is there anyone in this room who does not understand German? Please raise your hand. There's one person over there. We're going to do that in English then. Okay. Um, I know we are all tired. It was a long day. Um, this is a pretty tough talk. Um, so it's going to be 45 minutes hardcore technical content. Um, so I, I try to actually, what I want to do is I, I try to keep you awake. Huh? Okay, so this talk is about Angular to change detection. And I'm, so my, my goal today is to actually show you um, how change detection in Angular 2 works, um, what the, uh, you know, the different ways that you actually have to make change detection even faster, because Angular is already super fast. And there are like many, many cool things that we can do. And uh, right. And yeah, so by the way, I'm actually Pascal, and uh, I'm a Google developer expert for the uh, Angular team, and I'm also a trainer at um, ThoughtRam. So I do Angular trainings, Angular 2 trainings, and Git trainings. And we have, um, we have a blog where we actually regularly blog about Angular 2. So if, you wanna, like, if you're interested in Angular 2 in general, you might want to check that one out. In addition, we started a project called Five Things Angular. And this is a project that basically um, gives you a weekly newsletter on Five Things Angular, and specifically about uh, the development of Angular 2 and also community stuff. So because nowadays, it's really hard to keep track. There are like so many things happening. And this uh, mailing list is there to help you out, to, you know, so you can focus on important things. And yeah, you might want to subscribe there, too. This talk is going to be, as I said, somewhat technical. So if you happen to not understand some certain things, don't worry about it. It's really not super duper easy. But there is a link right here, and I'm going to share uh, a link to these slides after the talk, where um, we have an article on that topic. So you can actually read everything um, what I'm talking about right now. Let's start off with change detection. So what is change detection, actually? Um, and since we're doing web applications, I would like to start with a thing that we usually call model, right? So in applications, we have a model like application state that somehow represents the data that we have in our application, right? That can be some user data or some, um, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to build, you have some sort of model. In JavaScript specifically, we have different object structures that can also, um, you know, point to each other. So that's why we have um, you know, these uh, circles here that have like connections to each other. This is possible in JavaScript. And, you know, we can have like objects, arrays, and strings and stuff. These are just JavaScript data structures, right? And then on the other side, we have this thing called DOM. And this is basically the thing that we, that we use in the browser to, you know, take that application state, take that data, and then make it visible to the, to the uh, user in, in the UI. And so our application state might end up as you know, things like paragraphs or forms or buttons or links or whatever. Um, and after all, that kind of process, like to take this model state and kind of you know, make it visible to the, to the user, um, this is the, you know, the process that we simply call rendering. right? So that's the, the usual thing that we do. And in fact, this is, um, after all, a very, actually a very simple thing to do, right? Because it's, after all, just a, just a function that takes some model state as an input and generates some HTML or DOM as output. However, it turns out that it gets a bit more complicated when we want to keep track of things that can change during runtime. So let's say um, we have some users that uh, interact with our UI, you know, they click a button, um, they maybe perform an AJAX request to the server, which then returns with new data. And so there's like, you know, th there are like many things that can happen in our UI um, that trigger some sort of change. And so um, the tricky part here is that um, we have this model that is actually decoupled from the DOM, 
but still it has some connection in the sense that if there's a change somewhere in our model, we need to update the DOM in the right place. So we need to find out which DOM node do we actually need to update with the, with the new data. And we also want to keep these operations as low as possible because DOM operations are usually very expensive, right? This is like most of the time like the, you know, the slowest thing we can do in, in, in front-end applications. And in general, to like solve this problem, like keeping track of changes and then you know reflecting the changes of the model in the UI, um, there, there are like different ways to handle that, right? Like you have things like simple um, HTTP requests, for example. Like when you click a link, you send a request to the ser to the server, you get a new response, um, you know, like new HTML, which results in new DOM. This is like a classic website. We can have things like uh, virtual DOM, the thing that uh, React uses to um, solve that problem. And uh, yeah, but after all, we, we only have this one goal, which is data projection. We want to take that application state, we want to make it visible to the UI, and also during runtime, right, as changes are happening. If you want to uh, read more on that topic in general, I recommend you this article here by Tero. It's called Change and its Detection in JavaScript Frameworks. In this article, he kind of gives an overview of you know, how React um, does it with uh, virtual DOM, how AngularJS does it with uh, dirty checking, and that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, but now that we know um, what, what um, basically what the goal is, right, that we have changes and that we want to reflect the new changes in the, in the UI, we first need to ask ourselves, what is it actually that causes change, right? And it turns out that there are, after all, like three, three different things that can actually happen that cause change. And I would like to start off with this template right here. So who in this room has actually done some Angular 2 already? OK, we have like almost half of the people here. So for those who are not familiar with Angular 2, this is an Angular 2 component template. It's actually pretty, pretty simple. We have like you know, headline with first name, last name, uh, last name. Obviously, these two things are expressions, right? And they get evaluated at some point, and then you know they turn into actual values. And then we have this button here, um, and it has this you know parentheses and then click. This is just the declarative way in Angular 2 to bind to the click event of that particular DOM element, right? So you can bind to any event with that syntax. And apparently, what we do here is that we we basically we display a first name and a last name. And then there's a button. When we click that button, there is something called change name that is executed. So change name is obviously some sort of function that is somewhere defined that is executed when this button is clicked. Now let's take a look at the component that actually um, takes care of this, of this template. So this is a very simplified view of that component. What we see here is um, a simple class, uh, ES2015 class, or actually this is TypeScript code, which is a superset of ES2015. Um, so this class has some properties with uh, type annotations. There we actually see that we have first name, last name with actual values. And then there is this method called change name. And change name is a function that simply changes the first name and the last name. That's all it does, right? There's like nothing special going on there. But it turns out that this is actually the moment where the application state changes. So when the button is clicked, the application state changes, right? Keep that in mind. Another example uh, is this one, right? Imagine we have some sort of contacts application where we want to list our contacts. So we have a component, contacts app. It has a property contacts, which is a list of contacts. Initially, it's an empty collection. But then what we do is, once this, you know, once this component is uh, initialized, we perform an AJAX request to the server, and we get a new, um, you know, we get a list or a new collection of contacts back. If you uh, watch the other talks about reactive programming and uh, observables, this is pretty much the same thing. The HTTP layer in Angular 2 returns an observable when an HTTP request is performed. We can subscribe to it, and then we get our new contact data in this, in this case. And again, the moment that data returns and the moment we assign that new data to our context property, the application state has changed. So if we think about it, um, actually, there are, like, an infinite um, like set of things that can change application state. And that is events. So we have click, we have submit, we have, uh, I don't know, like mouse move and these kind of things, user events, um, DOM events. 
we have XHRs, um, so basically getting data from the server, um, doing AJAX requests. And then there's also, because we do JavaScript, things like timers, right? Set timeout, set interval. So these are the things that can actually possibly um, change our application state. And it turns out that there's like one thing that they all have in common. All these three things are asynchronous. And so now that we know that these are the things that can usually um, you know, change our application state, we might wonder, what is it that tells Angular, hey, listen, there is, is this event, like someone clicked this button, or there's this AJAX request that came back. Um, please go and perform change detection, because maybe something has changed. Right? We don't know, but maybe something has changed. So there, there's like something that notifies Angular. So that's the question. Who notifies Angular? And obviously, since this is Angular, there has to be some sort of magic, right? Actually, it's not that. It's actually a thing called zones. And zones is a feature that is originally a language feature of Dart. Yes, Dart is a thing. And um, the, the Angular team basically took that feature and backported it to JavaScript. So they've written a JavaScript library called Zones.js, and it's basically an implementation of that API. And Angular uh, takes advantage of that. But before we dive into how zones work and how zones notify Angular that a change has happened, um, let's first understand JavaScript, because it turns out this is sort of needed um, to get the hang of it. So let me take you on a little journey. I want to talk about um, how JavaScript is actually executed in the browser. Right? Like what happens when we have this script in our HTML document that is you know, fetched by the browser and then executed in our uh, browser VM? And so the first thing we need to realize is that JavaScript is single-threaded, right? So that means we can only execute one code at a time. There's like no way to have like multi-threads in that sense. There's a thing called web workers. I do not dive into that one. But if you have like normal JavaScript, um, like nothing special going on there, it's really just single-threaded code that is executed one step at a time. And so JavaScript basically then has a single call stack, right? And um, the, core, the call stack is the thing that basically keeps track of, um, like it records where we are in the program when that program is executed. So if we take that code, we have a function uh, bazinga, which calls bar, and we have a function bar that calls foo. Um, here's what it looks like when it's executed in the browser. So basically, the script itself is already something called a main function. And that's the thing that is then added to the stack. Right? So we execute the script. The browser adds, to, uh, added, adds that to the stack. And then it kind of you know, it parses the, the script. And then at some point, it says, oh, right, there is this uh, call to Bazinga. And Bazinga is a function that executes bar. So first, Bazinga is added to the, to the stack. Then we execute bar. Bar executes foo. And then foo does something. At some point, foo returns. So the function is executed. And at that point, foo basically pops off the stack, and then bar pops off the stack. Same goes for Bazinga, and then the program is done. Right? So that is basically synchronous JavaScript. That happens when you have a script that you like, simply execute. And you now you might wonder, OK, well, that's like nothing special. right? Like, Why are we even talking about that? Well, it turns out that when we have asynchronous JavaScript, like some asynchronous operations like you know, events and timers and that kind of stuff, um, it gets a bit more complicated, or actually th there's like a, you know, a very interesting mechanism that takes care of executing our code without um, you know, interrupting the main thread. And here's like in a very, very simplified way what that looks like. So on the left-hand side, we have, again, a function foo that is executed. We call set timeout with a callback. Um, it doesn't really matter what that callback does, but um, the set timeout is set to zero, right? So you might think this is something that immediately executes, but it's asynchronous. We're going to uh, take a look at that in a second. And then we again have our stack, and then there's this thing called web APIs. That's something that is provided by, by the browser, right? This is nothing that JavaScript as you know, VM provides. This is like a browser uh, you know, specific thing. If you do Node.js, then these are APIs um, uh, provided by some C++ layer or something. So web APIs is, is the thing, basically, that gives us things like set timeout APIs and DOM APIs and stuff. 
And then we have the event loop and the task queue. And I'm going to explain real quick what the event loop does. So again, we execute the code. We have the main function, right? We edit uh, the, the, the VM, adds that to the stack. Foo is executed. Foo returns, so it pops off the stack. And now we execute set timeout. Set timeout comes with a callback. And basically what we do here is we schedule that callback in the web APIs. This is what happens behind the scenes. And then as soon as, as the timer is done, something happens. We cannot just, or the browser cannot just randomly execute that callback once the timer is done. Because this is like single threader. We cannot just, while some other code is executed, execute that callback, right? That would be, that would introduce like many bugs. So basically what we do here is we schedule that timer and then the callback just sits there. It just sits there for now. So the set timeout returns pops off the stack, and then we have the bar function, it pops off the stack, synchronous code done, right? And now we still have this callback lying around there. So now, this is where the task queue comes into play. As soon as the synchronous um, code execution is done, basically what happens is, like, also when the timer is done of that particular t set timeout, the callback is basically pushed to the, ta to the ca uh, task queue. So it ends up right there. And then we have this thing called event loop. And what it basically does is it's like a little loop that is like running all the time, and it checks if the call stack is empty or not. If it's empty, it takes the next task from the task queue and then pushes that to the call stack. Right? So basically, the timer is done, and then the task queue task is added to the call stack, and then it's just normally executed as we know it. Boom. Right? And that's the reason why a callback using set timeout that is set to zero, so no milliseconds, um, that even that is executed after the rest of the, the, the synchronous script. This is what people also call the next tick, right? Synchronous JavaScript. And the same thing applies to APIs like at event listener and stuff, right? Whenever you do some sort of asynchronous operations, this is what happens behind the scenes. And if you want to learn more about that, actually, this was like a three-minute rip of, of Philip Roberts' talk, What the Heck is the Event Loop Anyways? This is a link to the talk. Um, you should definitely watch that one. He explains it way, way better than I do. And so now, the interesting thing is that this is, since that is JavaScript, the exact same thing happens in Angular as well, right? Because Angular is also just JavaScript. Yes, it's written in TypeScript, but TypeScript just transpiles down to JavaScript, right? After all, it's JavaScript that is executed in the browser. So now, we still need that thing that basically tells Angular, hey, this set timeout call is done, and maybe the callback has changed our application state. So we need to perform change detection. And zones, as I mentioned, is the thing that basically comes into play at that point. So zones is an API that allows us to perform some operation when a task is done, like when we enter a task or when we leave a task. And a task is sim simply something like uh, a callback or a set timeout call, right? So if we take that same code, foo set timeout bar, we can run that code in a zone using zone.run, right? This is like the, the API that we get from zones.js. This is like just zones. This is not Angular even. And so if we do that, the code executes the exact same way. There's like no difference at all. But what we don't see at this point is the set timeout call that we, that we execute here is actually not the global one. It's delegated to a zone API. What we actually call is zone.setTimeout. And that one wraps the native API. Zone does that with all asynchronous APIs, like pretty much all asynchronous APIs. It patches them. And so what it allows us to do is, uh, or basically what zones.js does, it, it, it wraps um, hooks around that call. So we can take advantage of that. This is the moment where we can actually be notified when, the, when uh, zones say, yeah, this is the next ta task that we start right now, and this is the moment when a task is finished. So basically, this thing is already monkey patched, even if we don't know it. But now we have APIs, we have hooks that we can be informed when, when that task is done. And this is exactly what Angular needs, right? Angular needs to be informed when some sort of async operation has been executed so it can update the DOM, right? If you, who is then Angular 1 here in this room? OK, almost everyone. If you know scope.apply, that's the same thing in Angular 1. You don't need that in Angular 2 anymore because don't take, take care of that. 
they inform the framework. They inform Angular, hey, there's this task that is done, the set, time, uh, set timeout call is done, so please perform change detection. Here's what it looks like when we extend a zone. So, and also, this is more or less what, what happens behind the scenes. right? We can fork the global zone, like the, the root zone. And as you can see, we have some hooks. We, we also give it a name, like we have on enter, we have on leave, right? It just executes the code, but whenever a task is executed, something like set timeout and all other asynchronous APIs, it will also call the on enter and the on leave uh, hook, right? This is what it does. So again, this is what Angular also does. If we take a look at Angular, it turns out Angular has its own zone. It has something called ng-zone. It's pretty much another fork of that zone. Like, with, I mean, with fork, I mean zone.fork, right? Not a fork of the repository. So it's basically extending the, the native uh, zone and adds some other APIs to it that are based on observables, right? So we have things like on micro task empty, which is basically the observable that tells us, hey, this task here is done. And then if we take it further, Angular does pretty much just that. Some, like at some point in the source code, this is now like a very simplified version, but after all in the source code, here's what happens, what triggers change detection in Angular 2. It basically subscribes to the on micro, uh, micro task empty event, or the, the observable, and whenever a task is done, it executes something called tick. And tick is simply a function that executes all change detection reference, references. So that's the moment where it performs change detection. So now we know what is the thing that informs Angular that change detection has to be performed. This is the reason why you don't have to do scope.apply anymore. Okay? I know this is like very technical, but you can read about that stuff here. We have two articles on our blog, Understanding Zones. This is like a kind of overview about zo zones in general, and then zones in Angular 2 specifically. It's pretty much the same stuff that we just talked about. OK, so now that we know what triggers change detection, now we can actually start talking about change detection. So change detection in Angular 2 looks something like this. In Angular 2, a, an application is usually a tree of components. Right? So you have some sort of root component. That root component uses some child components, and then it goes all the way down. So here we have a component tree. This is some sort of application. And the first thing we need to realize is that every component in Angular 2 has its own change detector. Right? This is why that the code that we've seen before iterates over all change detector references, because there's not, not just one change detector. Right? There are multiple change, detector, uh, change detectors for each component. And this turns out to be super great because now we actually have um, a change detector per component that allows us to configure per component how change detection is performed. This is super powerful. But let's first talk about how change detection is executed. So this is our application, and now you know, some sort of event is happening. A user clicks a button, or an HX request returns, or whatever. So we have some event happening right there. What now happens is that change detection kicks in from top to bottom for all components, right? And always from top to bottom. And this is a great thing because it tells us basically um, we, we always know where data comes from. Since change detection is always performed from top to bottom, data always flows from top to bottom, right? Another nice thing about that one is that it gets stable after a single pass. There's no such thing like a digest cycle anymore. Just one path and th pass, and then it's done. But again, super important, change detection is always performed from top to bottom. No matter what you do, it always starts at the root component. OK, I have a little demo here to actually show you that uh, you know, the stuff that I'm talking about actually works. Um, I have a couple of demos. So this is um, an Angular 2 application. It kind of visualizes like a tiny component tree. And if I refresh this page here, you will see that all, all the components turn green. And this is basically an indicator that change detection is performed, right? So I refresh the page, and you'll see it's all green. 
and then boom, they're blue again. There's also this button right here. I can uh, click trigger change detection. This is just some sort of button that just triggers or you know, triggers a click event. It doesn't even do anything. It just fires the event. And that, again, causes zones to inform the framework. We all know what it does now, right? OK, so this is the basic change detection process. So now we might wonder, OK, now, since we have to execute change detection for all change detectors of all the components, how fast is it? Victor Safkin is part of the, oh, sorry, I'm actually not in the slides anymore. Let me fix that real quick. Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. Big screens here. Boom. So Victor Safkin is um, a core team member of the Angular team. He actually, he actually built the uh, change detection mechanism. And he says, well, it's usually very fast. Yeah. Mm. It is actually about 10 times faster than Angular 1. But actually, I think it's even, even faster. And the reason why it's faster is that Angular generates VM-friendly code for better performance. So it can basically perform hundreds of thousands of checks uh, in a few milliseconds. So what does that mean? Well, if we think about a component tree where every component has its own change detector, how does Angular implement that? Like, we need to have some sort of um, uh, you know, like change detector class or something that takes care of you know, check if there are some changes. But if we do like one change detector class for all of our components, like some generic class that Angular provides, then that means we have dynamic code. Right? We need to have some dynamic algorithm that you know, finds out all the properties of the components and then checks them. And this is called uh, polymorphic code. And that's code that VMs, like browser or JavaScript VMs, cannot optimize. What Angular does is it basically generates change detectors for each component for us at runtime. It generates these classes for each change detector at runtime. And these are basically then written in a way that they match that component, right? So they're written in a way as if you would basically write a change detector manually uh, for each component in a way that it you know, performs change detection as fast as possible. Angular does that for us. And that code is called monomorphic code. And VMs can basically take that code, because what happens is that these change detectors, since they are explicitly built for these components, they know about the structure of all of these properties. So they know that our contacts app has a contact property that is always an array, or a contact property that is always of type contact, or whatever. It's always the same structure. So it can, build, it, it can be written in an optimized way, which is monomorphic. And VMs can take that code and optimize it. It's basically the fastest code that can actually be written and be executed in a VM. And this is what happens behind the scenes. This is what Angular does for us. This is what makes change detection super fast. If you want to learn more about monomorphism, there is uh, like a great article on that. Um, pretty hardcore, actually. <laughs> I tried to read it. I, I think I failed. OK, some facts. Change detection in Angular 2 is a directed tree. So we always perform change detection from top to bottom. And that makes change detection way more predictable because we always know where the data comes from. Right? A child component always gets its data from a parent component. It gets stable after a single pass. Right? There is no digest cycle happening anymore. And it generates uh, VM-friendly code, so it's even faster. So even though this is like already super, super fast, we can do even better. It turns out we can make uh, change detection faster when we know about some certain things that are happening in our application. So Angular checks every component every single time an event happens. Right? It has to check for every component every single time. The reason for that is that JavaScript objects are mutable, right? We don't know if something has changed. Angular doesn't know either, so it has to perform change detection. And we can actually fix that by using immutable data structures. But first, I want to quickly dive into mutable objects so we all know what we're talking about. Let's just take a look at this Angular 2 component right here. 
So it's a vCard app. This is just some app. This is our root component, and it uses one child component. It's called vCard component, right? It's right there. And vCard uh, component takes some data, some input data. It's called vData. And we pass in an expression called vData. And vData is simply an object with a name and an email property, right? So we just simply pass that object to that child component. And then there is a method called changeData, which uh, changes the name property of that vData object, right? So now let's see what happens when we let's imagine there's an event that executes that change data method. So we have vCard app, and it uses a uh, vCard component. And we know that vCard component gets its data from the vCard app. And we know that vData is like a simple object that has a name and an email property. Now an event is happening. Change detection kicks in, the name property changes because that's what the change data method does, right? Now, change detection basically kicks in for vCard component, basically checks if the new data that comes in is the same as the old data. And of course, it is, because, well, the reference is exactly the same, right? However, that's actually the reason why it has to check that component. Because, well, the, the, the reference is exactly the same, but maybe some property of that reference has changed. And it, it did in that case. We changed the name property. And this is why change detection is performed for that component. And that's why Angular is basically conservative by default and checks every component every single time. It has to. But what if we could tell Angular that actually things have not changed and that change detection does not have to be performed for that particular part of the application? Well, it turns out we can with immutable data structures. So immutable data structures basically give us some uh, certain guarantees, right? They're the uh, exact opposite of mutable data structures. So immutable data structures are basically objects that cannot change. You have an object foo, you change a property, you get a new reference. You don't change that original reference, you always get a new one. That's what immutable data structure is all about. And it turns out that we can use that information to make change detection even faster. So let's say we have some API to create immutable data structures. There are libraries like immutable.js and some other libraries that I cannot remember the name anymore. But you, know, you can use whatever you want, right? You just need some sort of API, or you even replace the, the hashes, the object hashes entirely. This is also some sort of immutability, because you get a new reference. So let's say we have some sort of uh, immutable API that we use to create our vData object. It has a name property. And now, since we cannot just change the property on that object because it's an immutable object, we need to use this API here called set. Right? So we say, please change the name property of that object. And what we get back is a completely new reference with that change. And if you actually compare these two objects, these are entirely different objects. Right? Different reference. So how can we take advantage of that guarantee that when a change has happened, we get a new reference? Well, <clears throat> since we now know that a change always results in a new reference, we can actually reduce the number of checks in our components when we tell Angular, hey, this component here does not change unless uh, you know, some sort of uh, property has actually changed in the sense of a new reference has been passed to that component. So if we use immutable data structures, we can tell Angular exactly that, because we know a new change or a change means a new reference. And then we can tell Angular, hey, please skip that subtree. So if we take a look at this component, this is the vCard component, right? The one that takes the vData. It only depends on its inputs, right? It takes the vData and it just displays them. That's all it does. It's pretty much a dump component. So now, if we would tell Ang Angular, hey, this component here actually needs only, needs only, need to, be, uh, only need to be checked when vData, vData has actually changed, then Angular could skip that subtree of that component entirely. And we can do that with a property on the component decorator, which passes metadata, 
or you know, adds metadata to the class, called change detection. And what it gets is a change detection strat strategy. And there are different types of strategies, and one is called on push. And on push basically means only perform change detection on that component if any of its inputs has changed. And we now know that a change means a new reference in case we use immutable data structures. Right? So if we visualize that again, vcard app, vcard component, vdata is name and email. Again, the event happens, change detection kicks in. This time, we do not change the name property of that object. It's immutable. vcard component checks if all data is still the same as new data. It is. It's the exact same reference. So then it can skip change detection for that subtree. Boom. So now this is really like a tiny app with just two components. But again, think about a huge component tree. You can actually have hundreds of components. Let's say that component here is set to on push. If an event happens, change detection is then only triggered for that subtree in case the input properties of that second component has not changed. And I have a demo on that one too in case you do not believe me. OK. So you can actually, there's like a sort of navigation up here. You can actually click on uh, on push change detection. You can actually navigate through that demo. I'm pretty proud of that one. So what we see here, again, is a component tree. It's a bit bigger, but after all, really just a component tree, right? We have like two components here set to on push. There are uh, three components here that are kind of blinking. This is just an indicator that you can click them and that they will fire, fire an event, right? So let's, again, refresh that page, and we will see that Angular first performs change detection for all components, because that's what it has to do initially, right? Boom, they're all green. Now, since this one is set to unpush, if some event is happening, let's say we trigger change detection up here, we see that only the right tree is actually checked because there's no property that has changed on component two. This is pretty powerful because that means if we use immutable data structures, we can make that change detection that is already freaking fast, we can make it even faster. If you want to um, learn a bit more about that, a friend of mine, uh, Jürgen from Belgium, he has written a very great article on how he optimized Minesweeper using Angular 2 and Immutable.js. So he basically, he built Minesweeper in Angular 2, uh, which was already pretty cool. But then he's written another um, you know, follow-up article that makes it even faster using immutable data structures. You totally want to check that one out. Another object that gives us some certain guarantees about a change that has happened are observables. And I think we heard about observables a couple of times now during this conference. So I'm, actually, I don't have the time to dive into observables right now. Um, but after all, an observable notifies us when an event is emitted. Right? You can subscribe to an observable, and when it emits an event, the thing that we pass to the subscription is executed. Now, if we imagine we would pass an observable object to a child component, and we set it to on push, change detection is triggered, we might wonder, how does that even help? Like, the thing is set to on push. The observable will certainly not change, because we always have the same reference. We do not want to pass different observable objects over and over again. So how do we deal with that? Well, let's say we build an e-commerce application with a little shopping cart. And whenever a user puts some product into the shopping cart, there's this little tiny batch with a number that increases, right? like a little counter. So we have a cart batch component. It has as input, uh, it gets an item stream. This is just an observable object that informs us when a new item has been added to the shopping cart. And so basically what we do is we subscribe to that stream. It can happen somewhere in our application. Like somewhere in our application, this observable emits an event. And this component here subscribes to it. And whenever an event is emitted, we increase the counter. So now, if we take a look at our component tree, everything is set, every, everything is set to on push, right? 
an event happens, change detection is triggered, but nothing happens here. Well, because the observable reference is still the same, we did not change it, right? No input property has changed at all. So the change detection propagation, uh, propagation stops. Well, it turns out that even in these cases, Angular provides us some really, really cool APIs so we can take advantage of observables. We can actually inject a reference to the change detector of that component, and we can tell the change detector, OK, listen, actually, this component is set to unpush. So you need to skip the entire subtree in case no input property has changed. However, if this observable here emits an event, we know that there might have happened a change. A change. So what we can do is we can take that change detector reference, and we can tell it, please mark this component or the path to this component to be checked when change detection kicks in. So visualized, it looks something like that. We have our component tree. Everything is set to unpush. The observable emits an event. We subscribe to it down there. So the component down here, this is our, our cart batch component. Since we mark uh, the path to be checked, basically that path of the component tree is, um, is basically kind of opened up. Change detection kicks in, but then only for that path. And then it restores the original state again. Again, this is way, way faster than checking every component every single time. And I have a demo on that one, too. And then we're almost done, promise. <clears throat> so if you scroll up here, there is input or uh, unpush change detection with observables. Same component tree as before, exactly the same thing, except that everything is set to unpush. And component 17 subscribes to an observable. That observable is somewhere in our application. We actually don't care right now, but we know it's there, and it will emit an event at some point. Again, if I refresh the page, we see that Angular performs change detection for all components initially, because it has to do it to reflect the data state, the model state. And now I have this button here that basically emits an event on that observable that component 17 subscribes to. If I click that one, we see that that path is opened up until comp like all the way down to component 17, whereas the rest is not checked. We can also trigger normal change detection. We will see that it basically stops at component 1. It doesn't even start because everything is set to unpush, right? This is pretty powerful stuff. Yeah. I, I see your excitement. I'm, I was that excited, too. <laughs> OK. And then there's one more thing. We can have even more control in case this is not enough. We now know that Angular performs change detection whenever an event happens, right? Now, let's say we have some sort of application that does some real-time you know, data communication. We have a WebSocket that pushes data to our application like many, many times a second. That would mean that Angular would perform change detection many, many times a second, right? It's probably something we do not want to do. We might want to say we only want to really perform change detection every five seconds, even though this thing is like pushing many times a second. Well, what we can do is we can actually um, take the change detector reference and we can detach the change detector of that component from the entire subtree. We can basically disable it completely and then enable it again in case we're interested in it. So what we see here is basically a component that has some sort of notifier. It's just, just another observable. We don't really care what, what it's for. We just know there's an observable. It emits an event. We subscribe to it. Initially, we detach the change detector. So when this component is initialized, there's no change detection performed for this one. We subscribe to that notifier, and we basically check some sort of you know, whatever we want to check, and then we can attach or, uh, detach or reattach the change detector. And that gives us even, even more control. So there's a demo on that, manual change detection. So this tree here, you see it's you know, only half of the tree is green. If I refresh again, 
only half of the tree is, is green because on, uh, at ng on init, we detach the change detector completely. And now there is this little checkbox right here, which reattaches the change detector to that component. If I click that one, you see it's opened up again. It's part of the change detection process. Again, I can click trigger change detection. It's performed for everyone. I can detach it again, and we'll see it's only performed for half of the tree. So after all, what we learned today is that change detection in Angular 2 is, is really, really fast. It basically solves all the problems that we had in Angular 1. And if it, if it happens that we use, or if we happen to use data structures like immutables or observables, we can make change detection even faster. And you don't even have to use either one or the other. You can mix and match as you want, right? Angular is like very um, agnostic about that. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.